So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Sunday talk. And I will be talking about the qualities of Lord Buddha's enlightenment. <coughs> In particular, I will just say, say a few words about external sex at the time of the Lord Buddha, who had a wrong view. <coughs> and uh, it was an important conversation that the Lord Buddha had with uh, a very, very influential supporter of the external sex and he would have a conversation with the Lord Buddha stating the qualities of these uh, practices that they were doing. They considered that action which we use for understanding karma by body, speech or mind as they understand it as a rod and they understand it that action done by karma is done by the body is the most heaviest find, form of karma and uh, and a few occasions, the Lord Buddha tried to cross-examine this uh, uh, a very intelligent supporter, and he uh, could not answer. And he says uh, he gave some very interesting similes, but basically to summarise that, if one does some action with the the body, and uh, then one must consider that before that action is done, there has to be some intention in the mind, or else that body cannot perform that karma. And so this is where they disagree on. So uh, as you see, even today in India, some very, uh, these external sex practices still are going on in this day and age. They will sweep the path and be very careful where they walk. And this is not wrong. I'm not saying this is wrong or right. But what they are misunderstanding is the very fact if they step on a being which there is no intention to harm a being and that being dies, such as an ant or something like that, they consider they have karma and that they have, uh, they have a debt they have to pay there, karmic, like a resultant karma that they have to pay, and there's no way that they can be liberated because of this karma that they've got, they've generated. And so this is what they understood, and saying this term here, which is a very excellent little term, which he summarised, uh, this uh, supporter of the uh, external sex, <clears throat> And uh, he would say, the rod, the rod, is the instrument of which individual torments himself, prolonging his bondage in samsara. Samsara means the, the wheel of existence, of life and birth, where, where, where we don't have an end. So just because we're born now, we're going to die, and we're going to, in future we'll, we will have continue to have suffering and happiness and pleasure, a mixture of suffering and pleasure and so forth, on and on. <clears throat> and thus torments... Uh, prolonging one's bondage in samsara, as I said, and thus torments others by causing them harm, the rod being the punishment, the instrument of punishment. And so this just uh, is what we're looking at. It contradicts the Buddhist views of intention of karma. And so that's, this is why they have this action of considering that this karma that they have to, they have to uh, delineate, delineate all this store of karma from the past where the Lord Buddha just says because I do not say that there is a termination of volitional karma that has been done accumulated and so that's very important so long one has not experienced results and and that may be in this life or in a future life so in this powerful statement we're looking at what the Lord Buddha is saying is that we are changing our destiny by creating good karma which was I talked about two weeks ago by developing these ten akusala karmas and that was in the uh, area of the, the body, the speech and the mind. So in these three divisions. So there's three in the body and there's four of speech and there's three regarding the mind. And so the mind is regarded the highest level. So once we've fulfilled our conduct in every way possible, we're checking it every day, yes, I'm meeting those criteria in my um, in my bodily actions and also my verbal actions, then it'll be a natural, we'll go to address our issue of our mind. And so, uh, and this will naturally have the knock-on effect of reducing longing in the mind, this desire, longing and jealousy, these quality of longing and desiring, and also uh, this quality of ill will and negativity, hatred, will also be reduced greatly. And thus, with those two reduced, then the mind has clarity because it's not disturbed. And this is what is the basis of mindfulness, is that one who has a basis of virtue, uh, upright moral conduct. So the Lord Buddha is saying that, yes, people can meditate, it's not a problem, and they don't keep virtuous conduct, 
but is that but the path is not just about uh, as we can say intention uh, right right speech action it's right intention right speech right action right livelihood so there is a difference here and so then there's a lot of talk now with a lot of practice in mindfulness being mindful and doing things but a criminal could be mindful in robbing a bank you see and it's totally wrong mindfulness because there is a such a thing as mindfulness exists regardless uh, one is practicing Buddhism or not and there is thing as such as meditation that exists regardless one is practicing Buddhism or not it does exist the mind can concentrate and it also can concentrate to do evil the mind can you know, develop a certain level of concentration to do evil if the mind but there's heavy karma consequences with that from generating such an evil mind state because Lord Buddha says we are the owners of our karma, heir to our karma, whatever karma we shall do of that we shall be the heir. So, uh, so if we do good actions we'll be heir to those good actions, we'll receive good results. So if we do bad actions we'll, we'll, we'll reach the results of those bad actions. And so then it goes on further, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, leader of the uh, external sect st uh, starts to criticize the Lord Buddha because they are not torturing themselves. And Lord Buddha, and previously to his enlightenment, went through these austerity practices and trained with these external sects because that was a time where he was trying to understand uh, release from suffering and uh, release from the bondage of samsara. And, uh, this, uh, he understood deeply that the, the, he had a deep insight prior to uh, his going forth that what, if, what there is to be uh, conditioned, there is also the unconditioned state. This is what he was seeking to understand what is this unconditioned state. Uh, because there is birth, there is death. Because there is aging and sickness, there will be a result of future aging and sickness. But uh, if there was no escape discern, then there would be no way out of samsara. So then this is what uh, a powerful statement of uh, trying to define what is the state of uh, total cessation of suffering that he was uh, seeking. And so and one of the very important aspects of that was that these uh, external sense were saying uh, there are these... Uh, Brahmins and, and external sex development of the body, but not development of the mind, and those who are development of the mind, but not development of the body. And they are touched with bodily painful feelings. Their thighs would grow rigid, their heart would burst, and hot blood would gush from their mouth, and he would go mad out of his mind, and his mind, uh, and so forth. And this would be two ways to be taken. It could be on the way of, uh, if he's training on the development of the body, then um, he would be subservient to the body. But if he was a training on the level of the mind, he'd be subservient to the mind. So they're pushing themselves. And this statement of heart would burst, hot blood would gush and from his mouth, and he would go mad, is this is what's saying that was their aim and objective of these external sets, is to push the level of one's ability to the, to the utmost extreme. And, uh, and, uh, and as you will understand, uh, some of their, uh, the other qualities that they were developing with this is that they were, um, for example, when they were pressing, putting much pressure on their body, they, was, they were, as what they had considered themselves, clothless ascetics rejecting conventions. So they were pushing themselves on, the, on both physical and mentally. And uh, they, were, they would lick their hands, not coming when called, not staying when asked. They do not consent to a food brought to them or dedicated to them or to an invitation of a meal, not accepting nothing from, from, a, from a mouth of a bowl, someone's offering from a bowl, or from a pregnant woman, or from a woman nursing, breastfeeding, or from where there were dogs waiting, or flies buzzing. They were just extreme. So then they would say no. Because, and all these reasons why they said no, no, I won't accept food from there, is because that would deny other beings food. And denying them is causing me karma. So they had this concept that this bodily is a result. I have to punish this body to clean. I have to pay for all my sins. I have to redeem and clean myself for all this punishment. So they would just push themselves to an extreme. And even Lord Buddha, 
not knowing the way out, joined in, partaked in that style of practice to the utmost extreme, exploring it. And because uh, he still was trying to understand the works of karma, what is, uh, what is uh, useful, what is, what is wholesome, what is not. And that's what he came with, the deep understanding. There are these ten wholesome uh, things which we can do and ten unwholesome things. And this is what will promote good qualities and, and happiness and leading us to, uh, to the path of liberation. <clears throat> and so the Lord Buddha says, but what have these external sects? Even himself practiced that. He, he just uh, played with this uh, Brahman and says, what had they learned from doing these practices? Is he wanted to test them. And when Lord Buddha was practicing under these austerities, he said himself, there was no one greater the master of perfecting these asceticists and himself, he pushed it to the utmost extreme. Where for these asceticists, would, what they would do after a period of a fortnight, they would take a break and they would start uh, uh, feeding their body again and, and building up their body and strengthening their body. So then they have enough energy to carry on. If they went on as they did, just practicing these extreme austerities of accepting only one mouthful from a house uh, or or every second day having a meal, and then every third day, every fourth day, going up to every 15 days, every 30 days, and repeating it on and on, they would just wear themselves and they would end up collapsing and wouldn't be able to practice. So they saw, well, we have to have some nourishment to keep the body going. And so because of that, they were just basically what now modern day psychology is talking about is suppressing uh, unwholesome states. They were just, they were not looking at the causes of them, what they are trying to eradicate or wear away. And they weren't promoting any wholesome qualities. So they were just pushing themselves mentally to the point where, like you were saying, basically they would go mad. And that was the whole idea, to just go mentally, absolutely. They didn't know anything anymore. They thought this is the only way because of the mind didn't understand. There was no one to teach them what is wholesome and what is unwholesome, what leads to producing karma and a birth into the, into the lower realms and what produces karma that results in the, in the higher realms. And this was not understood. There was no clarity. There was a lot of confusion at the time of Lord Buddha that he had to work out and resolve and understand so then Lord Buddha just makes a very, uh, very smart, witty comment. It says, so uh, this is how you say there is the, the increase and, and the decrease of the body. So because they're talking about that the Lord Buddha is undeveloped in the body, you know, but we are developed in the body because we're doing these austerity practices, you see. But you see, we can say the same as people with wrong view. They, they say, oh, you know, we're, you know, we're not suppressing our anger. If we're angry, I have a right. If I just suppress it, I'm just going to bottle up and I'm going to explode and get angry. And this is, and this attitude of saying, oh, people who suppress it, which a lot of people do because they see it's not wholesome and they try to suppress it, but then under circumstances they blow up and explode. And, and, I, and, and we can see the quite concept with this is that suppression is about not understanding the cause and it's having a, a blind aspect of approach. So those who are suppressing are saying, I'm angry, I'm going to suppress it because it's not right, shouldn't be angry. And then because of that, um, because the situation is too great, they're under too much pressure, they explode. And it's the same as these ascetics. They put themselves under so much pressure that they will explode. Originally, they'll go out of their mind and mad and, uh, and they'll do something very unwholesome and they'll generate a lot of unwholesome Karma, the Lord Buddha said a lot of them do go into the lower realms because they are creating such unwholesome mind state. The very fact they're trying to purify themselves, but the, the very uh, genuine sincerity, but the, the technique and the attitude is absolutely wrong. And it's, it's not uh, uh, potentially at all. There was one particular practice that the external sex was doing. It was called dog practice. They would imitate a dog. And they thought if they imitate a dog, they will reduce... Uh, all those qualities and he came up to see the Lord Buddha and the Lord Buddha says don't ask about your rebirth and he said don't ask you know because what you what you generate in your mind what the things you generate this is what you incline to this is where the consciousness will go to so he'll be inclined to go to a, to be born as a dog and this was the whole idea that he didn't want to be born as a but he wanted to he thought if I if I imitate another animal another thing another being I'll reduce all my karma. So they were exploring all these ways to reduce the sense of attachment to self and idea notion of 
but me to the point of extreme, like holding their hand up, you know, and, you know, it's rigid. And then, you know, and some monks, Theravada monks have met some of these ascetics and says, so did you benefit by that practice? They actually met some of these and says, no, I've just got a lot of pain I have to deal with day in, day out. It hasn't reduced my suffering or negativity at all. But, you know, because they don't have uh, fundamental principles or how to practice, you see. And so because of this quality of suppression, this is what I wanted to point out. This is the danger of our modern society is that there are habitual tendencies to be behave like these external sex and suppressing things. So then we are uh, under the dispensation of the Lord Buddha Gautama. So he is truly, for us who are Buddhists, see him as our, our, our great master, our great uh, Lord, and Lord and light, guiding light for us. So we paid heed to his advice because he's endured so much and has such profound wisdom. And uh, he himself said that even uh, the, the great Arahants who have completely uh, exhausted all forms, of all, all, all suffering and uh, have released and entered the Nibbana can only be compared to him like, like, a, like a speck of dirt on their nail compared to their knowledge and all ominous knowing that he has is like the earth. So even though they had the same attainment, but the qualities of Lord Buddha are far superior and great. So it's actually, we are so blessed and lucky to have his teachings to, uh, to, uh, to uh, look deeply into such as what us, the Buddhist monks are supposed to do, to analyze them very deeply and to give talks like this. And so, and then, and then he goes on with, the, then the Lord Buddha says, then how is one developed in body? And then how is one developed in mind? Wherefore, you're saying uh, I'm undeveloped in body and I'm developed in mind. And uh, there is a case where someone has pleasant feelings arise in an educated, un, in a, in a run-of-a-mill person. So it's just basically an ordinary person who doesn't know anything. One being touched with pleasant feeling, he becomes impassioned with pleasure and is reduced to being impassioned with pleasure. His pleasant feeling ceases. With the cessation of that pleasant feeling, there arises painful feeling. On being touched with painful feeling, he sorrows, griefs, laminates, pain, beats his breast and becomes distraught. When that pleasant feeling had arisen in him, it invaded his mind and remained because of his lack of development of the body. When that painful feeling had arisen in him, it invaded his mind and remained because of his lack of development of the mind. So he was arguing that the Lord Buddha were, were a particular sect that were developing only the body and not the mind. And there was one particular practice that the Lord Buddha did in external sense, which is biting down on the teeth. And it's recorded that one puts so much pressure on it, it's trying to mentally shut down consciousness. It's trying to kill consciousness, the arising of consciousness. And they say in the scriptures, in the commentaries, that some of these ascetics did achieve that state. And there is a very high state that where one can potentially cut off the mind for a period of uh, a long period of time, but then it, because of karma, because they have not purified the 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 uh, the, the chitta, that will re reappear again. But because of that heavy pressure of that uh, practice of torturing themselves, putting themselves under pressure, it is possible to actually. To, uh, to actually cut off. There's one particular practice that the Lord Buddha looked at and he saw this is extremely dangerous, extremely dangerous if it's uh, not, not achieved. And so then he's now opting for a much more understanding. Here we're understanding the nature of our body and mind and this is what he's saying we should pay attention to because it's mere effect. As we know, what I said before is that instead of suppressing things, we're looking to not suppress but looking at the cause. If we see the causes, then we can understand why I'm angry. So we should be investigating if I'm angry or situations made me angry, you know, we have to look at it in the view of right view. How does Buddha, Lord Buddha, uh, uh, discuss about anger, what his views on anger are? And, uh, and one of them is just basically, you're just as bad as them. If they are angry and you're angry, you'll know better, you're actually even worse. Because anger can never be justified. And this is how clever the mind is. It'll find a reason to justify it. And even some people will even justify it with Dharma. And this is really absurd. So then we can see uh, a classic example of that. I, I know of a situation, there was a group of monks gathering together and some, of course, not enlightened masters. 
and they had a bit of an argument and discussing how to do something and the and the very senior elders just walked away and they said this is this is you know they were just trying to deny the goodness of some of the other elder monks wanting to do some ceremony they denied them their the right to do that ceremony a very important event and because of that they uh they uh the, it was beautiful just to see how they behaved because they behaved exactly like a, a noble disciple the buddha they said i've done this because it's for the benefit of people and now you're telling me i cannot do this and it was like some other monks we were really evil minded so it does happen in this day and age it's not like we are free from that it does even happen in our circles as monks and it's terrible to hear but um but it's beautiful to see these beautiful examples that just behave exactly like in the time of lord buddha just know how to deal with that situation beautifully and of course the power of their power all the people support it so those monks were pushed away anyway and they were brought into forth and that what they wanted to do it was done and that's the power of goodness so if we really trust in and what they're trying to give us this message if we really are doing something noble and good something will come and support us but if it's something really rotten lousy evil uh of a negative thing then you know you know even though if we win and we're victorious and we you know uh, we get uh, fame and this that eventually it'll bring us down eventually the karmic consciousness of doing something that evil or denying people good or positive thing will bring us to uh, negative consequences so that's the beauty and this is the message that what the Lord Buddha is saying that with one that arises with painful feeling one is being touched with the painful feeling his sorrow griefs and laminates beats his breast and this is the reason why he's sorrowing why he's laminating because of this because of this quality of when when pleasant feelings arise in me he was reduced to being impassioned with that pleasure so this is a very important note what the board is giving us a very important clue here that we should not overlook and that is saying that why we're experiencing uh, sorrow and negativity is because of our imbalanced understanding of the of the, of the opposite so when we're experiencing pleasure and happiness we're not we're not doing it in an appropriate way you know in a proper manner you know we're getting carried away and lost with it so when we get carried away and lost with it what is that saying so when something goes wrong we're going to get really carried away and lost and get really miserable but let's say if a normal situation everyone's getting excited and you say no hang on okay great something's good happen but things come and go and we consider it in a very wise way we don't get we don't get intoxicated with it such as maybe we get uh Let's say we get promoted into a great job or great position. We don't get intoxicated. Oh, okay, all right. They want to give me a good job. Great, all right. We don't go waving the flag. I'm the greatest. And so then next week, if they say, "Oh, sorry, it was a mistake. We wanted to get someone else," we won't be we won't be grieving. But the person was running around waving the flag, saying, "Oh, great. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to kick up a fight." Say, "No, I want that job." You know. You see, there's a difference. You see, when we when we balance, we're mature things come much more in an even manner way because we are mindful we're not overblown by these uh, strong emotions and this is what the Lord Buddha is warning us the dangers of uh, these qualities he's not saying we cannot enjoy pleasurable experiences but we should enjoy it in the proper moderation because if we get intoxicated lost in them where is our quality of mindfulness where are we in that present moment then and there we are not there we are lost in it and so being lost in it when it passes away and then something goes wrong what's going to happen we're going to go to the other extreme because that's how our emotions work you can see it like a little child when it's really happy it's going mommy mommy i'm really happy it's great everything's going great but then when you deny it something and it's and it will sulk and cry and sulk and sulk and sulk i want this i want that it has no balance of mind because it's just run controlled dominated by its emotions it lives its life based on its emotions if I feel happy then I'm going to be happy if I'm sad I'm going to be sad how useless is that is that really worthy of your attention that's what the Lord Buddha is saying saying says it says is that how low your mind is you don't have enough mental strength to actually maintain a bit of a neutral state and just see it for what it is something that arises, it comes about and passes away and doesn't it feel great if you can do that you can see that pleasure and say okay fine great and goes away and then suddenly some un un misfortunate thing happens and what he's saying the mind is mature it can deal with it properly you see 
because the Lord Buddha says the potential of the human mind is great. That's why he said that all of us have the potential for going to developing to uh, deep levels of peace and happiness. So th this is how one is undeveloped in body and mind, as I was saying, through those things. And then there is a case where pleasant feeling, and then when he goes on going about development of the mind and development of the body, there is a case when there is pleasant feelings that arise in a well-educated disciple of the noble ones. Here again, it's showing the difference. Somebody who's actually studying the Dharma, is taking heed, has established right view, is developing the ten or kusala karmas. And then, bang, one being touched by pleasant feeling, he doesn't become impassioned. And you can see straight away, why is that? Because, for example, if he's a uh, karmesamuchara, you know, suddenly he's engaging with uh, somebody that he might have a, a relationship on the side, you know, he has an opportunity, it's, you know, come his way, and you know, whether it's a male or female, and, you know, and they're dating, and someone else that he likes, he wants to date. And he's impassioned, he thinks. And you see what this is, what movies are all about, you know. Uh, you know, love affairs and so forth. And they're fighting over the damsel in distress and who's going to win her and things like that. And this is what creates uh, this uh, intoxicating uh, love and passion. This is what fuels this desire. And the media tends to promote that because it's a good selling point to people that are, that are uh, easily lost in their emotions. So he doesn't become impassioned with pleasure and not reduced to being impassioned with pleasure. His feelings cease. So he's not reduced to passion, passion or impassioned. So yeah, with those feelings they cease and they just cease, fine, they cease. With the cessation of pleasant feelings, there arises painful feelings. One being touched with painful feeling, he does not sorrow, grief, laminate, beats his breast or becomes distraught. When that pleasant feeling had arisen in him, it didn't invade his mind and remain because of this development of the body. And when that painful feeling had arisen in him, it didn't invade his mind because of the development of the mind. And the divine development of the mind is based on the body. You can see it proceeds. This is what the Lord Buddha says. A pleasant feeling arises, this ceases, then a painful feeling arises and ceases in this sequential order. Okay, this is how we understand. And this is very true because when, when for example, the qualities of ill will and negativity, this is based in, uh, in the qualities of um, overindulgence and sensuality and nothing more. Hatred all comes from, is fueled from uh, uh, strong greed and strong lust. And a lot of people say it, it, that's, that's, uh, that's not true, but that's how, it, how it, the karma works, the consciousness of that karma. And when we explore it ourselves, we can see that with a very important quality, which I talked about about a month ago, was jealousy. And that's how that works. It operates on a very, very negative level. It's using qualities of desire, but it's mix, starting to mix with ill will and hatred. And so then this, uh, this uh, Brahman then asks Agavesana, asks the Lord Buddha, but perhaps there never has arisen in Master Gautama a sort of pleasant feeling that has arisen that would invade his mind and remain. And perhaps I have confidence in the Master Gautama in development in the body and development in the mind. Well, Agavesana, you certainly being rude and presumptuous. So the Lord Buddha is just really, you know, seeing that, you know, here I'm teaching you this and saying what we do as noble disciples, how we see these things. And he's saying, well, maybe actually I do believe that you can actually do that. And uh, this, this is quite very rude, what he was saying, what he was marking towards the Lord Buddha. Sp speaking your words, nevertheless, I respond to you. And then he talks about... He's uh, prior to going forth. Ever since I shaved my hair and beard, put on the, the orchard robe and went forth from the home life to the homelessness, it has not been possible for a pleasant feeling that has arisen in my mind and, and remained, nor a painful feeling that has arisen in my mind, nor remain. So then this quality, it doesn't invade and doesn't remain since he's a great going forth. So he, what he's saying is before he's going forth, this did bother him. Right, this, these qualities bothered him because uh, uh, even though he had great insights before he's going forth, and this is one of the things that he was really concerned about, these, uh, these, these uh, feelings not being uh, appropriate. And so he was uh, very intuitive about what is a renunciant. He saw that uh, indulging in sensuality is not, not suitable for renunciant at all, someone who's taking going forth. 
And even these external sects, they were doing, they're behaving like that. For example, they were trying to reduce their sensuality, but they do it to the utmost extreme, where they're suppressing it, you see, and they're thinking they're eradicating it by the, they have this excess of baggage of karma that they have to eradicate. And this is not so what the Lord Buddha said, that even though we have karma from the past, if we start developing these ten wholesome qualities, then there is no opportunity for it to arise. You see, because we are producing great good qualities of karma. In another talk, he talks about karma, the quality of if we have a pool of water, and that pool of water is a simile of all our, our, our negativity that we're doing, all our bad things we do, we add a bit of more water. Uh, no, sorry, we add a little bit of salt. Every bad thing we do, we add a little bit of salt in that pool of water. But then if we start doing good, we keep on increasing the volume of that water, that salt will become very hard to be discerned, the taste of that salt, because of all the, the amount of good we have. So this is what he's saying. Even though we might have this store of negativity before we started our Buddhist practice and karma, but we're reducing that greatly by we're constantly developing these ten kusala karmas. And so we're bringing more joy and happiness to ourselves. And so really, as most Buddhists, where their suffering really arises is much more in the mind. And that's the level where we start starting to develop meditation and where we're getting a lot of obstacles and difficulty in the practice of meditation. And so the Lord Buddha gave some advice with this regarding uh, our, uh, when he was on his, on, his, on his development of going towards enlightenment. The bhikkhus, before my enlightenment, while I was still a bodhisattva, not yet fully enlightened, it occurred to me, what is the gratification, the danger and escape in the case of feeling? And so this is an excellent thing. So even though he had no pleasant feeling would invade his mind, it remained, still he understood, he wanted to understand it deeply, how they work, how they operate, these painful pleasant feelings, how they occupy and dominate our mind in, in different ways. So obviously this showing that the Lord Buddha had a high level of concentration, right, yeah? Because as we know, as a child, he already developed the first jhana, which is a superhuman state. So uh, obviously one from his going forth, that practice of living renouncing it, not living in a palace, surrounded by a hundred maidens looking after him, and plus his queen, and being listening to music all the time, and eating whenever he liked, and all that pleasure was taken away, then he quite clearly saw that powerful break in him, a quite sort of this deep, uh, karmic uh, uh, knock-on effect. He was going into his previous good karma, his store of good karma, because this life, that very life, he was going to attain Buddhahood. So it's not, not by any means that he won't have any store of goodness in him, because it's not like, oh, I'm going to attain Buddhahood in this life. You have to have an incredible store of good qualities and potentiality, and they will start to bear fruit and show even from an early age. They say from the age of five even, he understood not to harm other beings, intuitively, without anyone saying him. There was a classic case with one of his cousins shot a, a beautiful white dove, and he rescued it, pulled out the arrow, and his cousin Devadatta said, no, that belongs to me. He says, no, it belongs to me because I saved its life. How can it belong to you? And then they fought over it, and, uh, and they went to the Brahmin priest, and the Brahmin says, it belongs to him because... You, you went to kill it, to hunt, to kill it for food, but it's alive, so you can't, you can't say it's, it belongs back to, its, to, to the, that person who saved it, to nature. So, all right, if you've killed it, then, you know, you can have it. That's what you want, really, a dead carcass so you can eat. So he was just showing uh, uh, that, that this quality that, you know, that, like as we chanted Karina Metta, even as a mother protects her only son, so should one develop loving kindness for the whole world, embracing. So then if we are arguing with someone, we're not doing what the Lord Buddha's asked, okay? So we've got to say, well, we're in an argument with someone, and says we've just got to allow and just understand straight away. They are the owners of the karma. With arguing, what you are saying is saying, I am owning his karma. I'm wanting him to behave how I want him to behave. But that's impossible. You can only practice the Dharma for yourself. You can't practice it for anyone else. So if you tell people, oh, please, when you use a toilet, clean the toilet, and someone doesn't cooperate, doesn't clean the toilet, doesn't mean I don't clean it as well. You go in the toilet, and you know your duty is, that's what we should do. If someone doesn't know to do that, you don't go around policing them and bossing them around. You just 
we, this is the beauty of Buddhism. It's, this is this quality where we understand, we take responsibility for ourselves and what we do and what effect we have in the environment around us, and we promote that. And the more Buddhists that are doing that, such as in this center, it promotes a powerful field of merit and powerful field of goodness and attracts many people wanting to know the Dharma and inspire to practice the Dharma. So what is this gratification? What is this danger? What is this escape that the Lord Buddha was, was exploring in feelings? Now, I'm just drawing on one of the aspect feeling. There is also the body, but the body's relationship to the feeling. So when we're talking about feeling, I'm also talking about the relationship to the body and also the other four, other, other three main aspects of this, which makes up uh, this human body, and that is perception, uh, mental formations and consciousness. Now, I won't go into detail about that because I talked about that about, about two months ago in very in detail in my very second talk. So if you go back for the talks I've been giving and, uh, and you can uh, see what I'm meaning about that. Uh, so the pleasure and joy that arises dependence on feeling. This is a gratification of feeling, okay? And now that feeling is impermanent, suffering subject to change. This is a danger in feeling. The removal and the abandonment of desires and lusts for feeling, this is the escape of feeling. So he gives it quite clearly, a very simple way of understanding the gratification, danger, and the escape of feeling. And so this, this feeling, this gratification of the feeling that arises and its independence of. And because if there were no gratification of feeling, Beings would not, and then he goes in analysis of it. He goes in a deep analysis of that's not enough. He wants to go into analysis. This is the classic Lord Buddha, how he's using the power of Dhamma. And this is how we should be as a Dharma practitioner, going, looking at things, looking at causes and understanding, breaking things up and understanding our experience, understanding why things are going in our life. He's asking us, we have that potential in our mind to look at the causes deeply in line with Dharma, in line with Dhamma, yeah? Not in line with worldly worldly views and attitudes because they are all about suppressing. It's all about this sense of, no, you can't do that, da, 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 you can only do this and that. So but without any understanding here, the Lord Buddha and the Dharma teaches us a path and teaches us cause and effect and it's beautiful. <clears throat> and if there were, beings would not be become enamored with it. So in this quality of if there were no gratification of feelings, then we would not become enamored with it. But because there is gratification of form, beings become enamored with it. If there were no danger in feeling, beings would not experience revulsion towards. But because there are danger in feelings, beings experience revulsion towards it. If there were no escape from feelings, beings would not escape from it. But because there is an escape from feelings, beings escape from it. And so long because, as I did not directly know as they are, the gratification, the danger and the escape in the case of these five ag aggregates or the five khandhas subject to clinging, I did not remain, did not claim to awaken the unsurpassed supreme enlightenment. And so this is a really uh, excellent way of uh, analysing it and uh, to understanding it uh, to, to the extent of where we can understand it uh, that if there was no gratification of feelings, beings would not become enamored. And that's excellent because, because we say, oh, I'm, there's no such thing as gratification. And if there's no such thing as gratification, then uh, there is no uh, uh, cause, cause and effect. And this is what maybe the external sex are saying, basically, where they're saying the rod, the rod, the body is the, the we must punish the body. You're not saying there's cause and effect. They're just seeing that something has been done and we have to eradicate it, so we have to terminate it. And this is quite a, a, a very, uh, how would you say, when people are under shock or, or, or panicking and they're trying to sort something out, they go to extreme measures, yeah? They behave in extreme without thinking clearly and they say, oh, just get rid of it, you know, without thinking the consequences. This, this attitude, just get rid of it or this and that without thinking the consequences. And that's what they're basing their practice on, you know? There is negativity, I want to get rid of it, let's just, let's just do the opposite, let's just do austerity. So they're exploring, and the Lord Buddha explored that and saw with that, that, that was, he did it to the point where 
he fasted to the point where he actually went to the river uh, to just bathe a little bit and he, uh, and he collapsed. He just basically collapsed in the river and he was drowning. Our Lord Buddha was drowning. By luck, by coincidence, there was a cow herd girl nearby and she pulled him out of the river. If she didn't pull him out of the river, we wouldn't have the, the Dharma with us today. So we have so much to, gratitude to her. And because of that incident, he almost died drowning in the river without pulling out. He couldn't even lift himself out of the river. You know, he was so emaciated that when he touched his, uh, touched his belly button, he would touch his spine. Or if he touched his spine, he could penetrate through, touch his belly button. And uh, there was just absolutely no, no, no meat on him at all. It was just skin and bones. It was incredible, the level of austerities. And he said even though he was practicing with such austerities, painful feeling did not invade did not invade his mind in the remain which is incredible because if we know ourselves when we're starving or hungry or got pain how easily it invades our mind and remains and we feel terrible about it and this is just showing the level of his powerful mindfulness and he said himself that he could not enter into a concentrated state because of he was so malnutri mal malnutrition not having any food and so not having any food and realizing that, then he would change his practice and then started analyzing things and considering things very deeply. What is the path? What isn't the path? He started then delineating what is and what isn't. And, uh, thus, and thus we can see so long as uh, from that point onwards, and then he finally says, why wouldn't I have Agassina? Before my awakening, when I was still an awakened bodhisattva, uh, I consider the household life is confining, dusty path. Life gone forth is open, f full of air. It's not easy to live the home life, to practice the holy life, totally perfected, totally pure, unpolished, uh, polished like a conch shell. And then he goes on to say he, he left uh, uh, the household life. So later time, when it was still in my young black hair, endowed with the blessings of youth in the, finals, in the first stage of my life, uh, though my parents wished otherwise and were grieving with tears on their faces, I put on the uh, orchard robe and went forth from the home life to homelessness, having gone forth in search of what might be skillful, seeking the unexcelled state of sublime peace. So he already understood that there is something skillful or not, even at that level. He understood and he was deeply developing that. So then naturally, th there's not much knowledge of actually what the law bidder did uh, when he did to going forth, there's not much. We have to really, the monks have to really do quite a bit of uh, exploration, but just to see that uh, a lot of people don't acknowledge enough that the level of the mind that the Lord Buddha had was far superior than any, any of his uh, noble disciples. And the very fact he had no teacher to guide him, yes, that's just incredible. So I just wanted to, just, just show honor towards the Lord Buddha's great power, even at that stage of just being, just still an ordinary person, yet, you know, not, you know, just starting to practice as a renunciant, you know, all the qualities that he had. The actual fact is that, and we can use that as a legacy for ourselves, that if we have pleasurable feelings, and we don't get lost away, don't get carried and lost away with them, you know, and you can use the same does not invade my mind and remain. So we're looking at that quality. He says, this is the quality we should be looking at. If we are getting lost in something very unwholesome, that is invaded our mind and is remained. And the Lord Buddha says, now how do we eradicate these qualities that have invaded our mind and remained? And that is these 10 akusala karmas. They are our training, you see. If we don't have something to, uh, let's say, uh, to uh, if you don't have a flintstone, how are you going to sharpen an axe? You need something to hone that axe to sharpen it. And what I mean by sharpening is sharpening the mind. The mind is blur, blur, blur. doesn't understand everything. It's just in a loss and a doze. And that's what it's like when we're under <laughs> unwholesome state. So when we wake up in the morning, we go, blur, blur, blur. I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to meditate. I don't want to do something wholesome. I'll just sleep in more. And one should actually go and bathe oneself, get up and do a little bit of chanting, wake up and do something incredibly wholesome. And then this, in that way, one's got some energy for the day, some positive energy. But if we're just blur, blur in the morning and then we just get up and we just do our routine, the whole routine, the whole day will be blur, blur, blur. And then we come home, we'll be more blur, blur, blur. So it's like 
You know, is it that much difficult to spend some time dedicating to training the mind? You know, you're all coming here because you're saying, help me, help me, I want to train my mind. That's what you really are saying. You're not coming here to be entertained. You know, you could go other places. You can go to infinite. You could be at your home playing, you know, Nintendo or this or that. But you don't want that. You want, you are, you're saying, I want to train my mind. I want to be with other people that are interested in training my mind. I want to reach more happiness and goodness. So by doing that, well then actually take responsibility of that mind that you have. Because you all can do it, yeah? You all can do it. It's a decision we make. And the more we decide ourselves, that is how it's, we have a powerful effect on our mind. So these simple things, we can see the gratification of danger and the escape. And we can clearly see, yes, I see what the Lord Buddha means. To have moderation in, in sensuality. If we're just over the top, like for example our iPhone, we're just playing with it endlessly, just looking for fun. That's incredibly unwholesome. That's incredibly unwholesome. That thing is just meant to support you convenience, to make a phone call, to, uh, to organize your files and do like that. And now, because it's so, so smart, they invite all these games to distract you, more applications, more fun, more, more seeking loss. And basically, you're just getting lost in, uh, in this convenience and luxury. And it's just weakening your mind, OK? So you've got a little bit say no to it and say, no, this thing I control, this doesn't control me, you know, you see? So, you know, you, you observe people with their phone on and on and on. You can see even myself, oh, you know, am I controlled by this gadget or, or am I controlling it, you know? And this is what we're learning about, you know, when we have, when we're looking for uh, distraction and this quality of distracting state, when we're in a state of distraction, we can't even see that the mind is impassioned or in indulging in something because we're in a distracted state, constantly jumping from one bit to another, shifting onwards, okay? So we need to develop the mind to concentrate it and to be aware of what's going on. And then when something unagreeable is happening to us and we know it's kilesa, we know it's unwholesome, we don't act on it, right? We're not suppressing it. We know that's a reason because of bad conduct. That behavior I, 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 have, I have promoted, now I'm bearing the results of that conduct now. So then the more we promote known anger, for example, and cooperation and humility, then that will reduce more and more, and then we'll be graceful. So then when people were in a situation where people are arguing they can't make a decision, you just say, this is wrong, and you just walk away. He says, I know, this is not right, this is not correct, there's no need. And you can walk away because you know they're doing something unwholesome, you don't want to partake in that. And when you do that and you develop good qualities and you promote goodness in yourself, then regardless of people doing it or not, that's not the point, you are doing it, you're making that decision for your own happiness. Okay? You don't have to, there's a problem with uh, people now, they're too much involved looking at each other. There's so much jealousy, so much competition, and that's what society wants you to do, wants you to look at each other and say, hey, you've got that, that's cool, I want that too, oh, you got that. Wants you constantly not allow you to develop your own personal integrity. You know, you have to be this, you have to be that, or so forth. Society, all the media, don't like Buddhism. They don't like, you don't see much Buddhism on media, because you know, they, they won't be able to market things, they won't be able to make any business, you see. People become wiser and more clar clarity of mind. So it's getting late, so I answer a few questions before we uh, we do the arahang and uh, show respects to the triple gem.